Hello, hello, and welcome to the regular season finale of The Takeaway. My name is Kel Clinton. With me, as always, is my co-host, Jackson Roberts. If you're here, you know the drill at this point. We round up all the hottest takes from around the NFL media landscape. Put them on the meter. You see just how spicy they are. And just how much truth is embedded in each one. Jackson, week 18, finally upon us. Got some big games coming up this weekend. You've got to be excited. Hey, I'm stoked. This is our last hurrah. You will, of course, continue to see us on the FO News Show every Wednesday. But with the end of the regular season comes the end of the takeaway. And we have something very special to conclude this episode for all of you folks at home little best and worst of our own takes. So that's something to look forward to. But before that, I promise you the take of sphere is still spinning out elsewhere this week. So we got a lot of work to get to. Kale, whenever you're ready, pal. That we do, Jackson. Listen, you get to a point where you only got like good, good teams left to work with come playoffs. There's not too many takes left to be had. The well runs dry, proverbially speaking. But we are going to wring every last drop out of that regular season rag. Get every take we can, every last drop. I'm hungry and I'm ready for it. Jackson, let's kick it off with award shows, Jackson. We've, listen, we've talked awards on the show before. We've, we did some MVP talk last week. We've talked some offensive, or like, you know, players of the year, some rookies of the year. One debate that feels the most contentious, the hottest race among the award superlatives. It's got to be Coach of the Year, right, Jackson? I'll tell you what, Kale. This award has been one of the most perplexing all season long. There have been times in this season where teams have been undefeated, and yet you have been talking as if coaches who were hovering around 500 were going to win the award. We have first-year coaches leading their team to division titles who aren't even in contention. We have coaches who have fallen off. We have coaches who have risen as the year has gone on. It is extremely perplexing, but at least one member of the media, and others behind him, mind you, but one member of the media is extremely convinced and willing to lay out a pretty coherent argument as to why one Brian Dable should be considered the headed for the favorite for head coach, Kill. Roll the tape. Let's hear it from the mustachioed man himself, Warren Sharp. Allow me to introduce you to the 2022 Coach of the Year, Brian Dable. At no point in any time during the 2022 season did the Giants have a losing record. This team was above 500 every single week this season. In his first year on the job, Brian Dable took a team that had the worst record in the NFL the prior five years, with no winning record of any kind during any one of those seasons, a team with a bottom five quarterback, bottom four cap space, top 10 most snaps that needed to be replaced, and a variety of other messes left behind from a regime run into the ground by Joe Judge and Dave Gettleman, and did what no other coach, and believe me, many were hired and fired trying, did with this roster. And that was to win games. And that was to make the playoffs. Imagine saying that at any point in time over the prior five years, that this team would actually make the playoffs and not just make the playoffs in 2022, make the playoffs and clinch it with over a week to go before the end of the season so that they have the option and the flexibility to rest players in the last game of the year because they've already punched their ticket to the playoffs. You, Brian Dable, coach of the year complete turnaround of the New York Giants organization. Jackson, put this one on the meter. Yeah, hot take, good take. I will admit that this was not a take that I shared for most of the season. I love Brian Dable. I think he's done a phenomenal job. I was on the Nick Sirianni train for the longest time, and I know you have always been more so the uh, the Howie Roseman Executive of the Year Award, and I still think that's going to transpire. And again, it's the same situation with Jalen Hurts, where I don't want to penalize Sirianni for losing these last two games without his starting quarterback. But I think the difference between a 16-1, 15-2 season and a 3-4 or loss season is great enough with all the vast additions to the roster on both sides of the ball that I am willing to look elsewhere. 
and yeah, I picked the Giants to win four games coming into the year. I had I had no idea this was in there. And the way that they've won games, whether it's the Baltimore game coming back at the end, whether it's kind of showing resiliency, beating Washington uh, in Washington in order to basically lock up that six seed. I know other things had to go wrong for Washington, but they've just shown that they have this fortitude, this ability to win the important games against teams of similar skill level that I think bodes hugely well for them down the road, even if I don't think this is the year that they contend in a pretty stacked NFC. I think that what Dable has done to set the foundation to preserve Daniel Jones's career, frankly, uh, to turn Saquon Barkley back into one of the best weapons in football, um, the defense is vastly improved, so obviously there's a a wink-wink, nudge-nudge to Mr. Martindale there. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I just have to give lots of props to what Dable and this Giants coaching staff have done this year. A wink to Mr. Martindale. Uh, I like that. Uh, the From what you said, the biggest thing for me has to be that turnaround for Daniel Jones and Saquon Barkley. This version of Daniel Jones that we saw this year is why he was picked as a first-round pick. Like, he looks like a legitimate quarterback. His processing has gotten a little bit better. Maximizes his mobility. Like, there's a lot of good things that you really have to like about what has gone right with Daniel Jones thus far. I think there are some interesting cases for other guys. I think in terms of turnarounds, Dan Campbell deserves a bit of a nod. Doug Peterson definitely deserves a nod. I'm still vastly, vastly perplexed by the Kevin O'Connell situation in Minnesota because of just how that team performed this year. We all understand that this is one of the luckiest teams in NFL history, uh, one of the worst well-performing teams in NFL history. It, like, it's got to be the coach, right? Like, what else could this be? So, like, I feel like he might get a bit of a nod. But is it the coach or is it just straight luck? That is what's so <sighs> tough to evaluate because you can look at it as Kevin O'Connell's coached a team with a negative 19-point differential, or you could look at it as, ooh, Kevin O'Connell has managed this team with a negative 19-point differential to 12 wins. It really is. Like, you can you can choose to look at it on either side of the coin. Oh, absolutely. And in terms of the front runners. Sorry, doorbell rang. In terms of the front runners, you've obviously got Nick Sirianni, who we've kind of talked about a lot. Kyle Shanahan, who has somehow built a quarterback-proof offense, which I think deserves its own level of credit. But what Brian Dable has done with like injuries, with the fact that Isaiah, Ho I keep bringing up Isaiah Hodgins and Richie James, because it is anomalous. That the New York Giants have gotten to this point where their wide receivers, like six and seven at the start of the year, are getting continuous reps, are getting, you know, double digit target games. The fact that these guys are getting not only like playing meaningful minutes, but playing like getting impactful reps and getting open on those reps. Like, hats off to Brian Dable for really making a most of an injury riddled new york giants team this is a team that like lost xavier mckinney to a bi-week motocross accident uh they've had like a laundry yeah. list of injuries all over uh, on offense and defense that they've had to deal with uh kenny galladay who's left over from I, the previous regime is just a non-factor on maybe the worst contract in football kenny galladay kale 76 receptions short of his uh, $750,000 bonus. So watch the stat line this week. You never know. Anything's possible, Jackson. <laughs> Feed Galladay the Rock. There's a world where it happens in some parallel universe. Definitely not this one, though. Uh, yeah, like just what Dable has done, given the roster, I think makes the most compelling argument. It's been really great to see this turnaround. And in terms of just like, 
if we're using coach of the year as like impact relative to roster or impact to a given team, there's no singular change in head coach that has created a bigger change than like Dable to the Giants. No one else is doing what he's doing right now. Going to agree with that. And the last thing I'll say on the subject before we move on is that uh, I would fully sympathize with anyone who wanted to vote for Kyle Shanahan for this award. I mean, like you said, the way he's just built a quarterback proof offense and continued to operate it at an extremely high level, unbelievable. Uh, But I think that to reward this 49ers coaching staff properly, what I'd rather do is give D'Amico Ryan's assistant coach of the year for building the best defense in football. And I think Kyle Shanahan would fully support that as well. I think that's the kind of guy he is to say, like, don't give me the award. Give my guy the award for building this unbelievable robot defense that shuts everyone down. I like that. I still think, like, Lions OC deserves Ben Johnson. The I like Shanahan just because you go into the year thinking Trey Lance is your guy. Like, no matter what, he's going to be your guy. Jimmy Garoppolo is your safe backup. Lance goes down. Garoppolo takes over. Goes really well. A top three season by Garoppolo in the league among quarterbacks. One of his best of his career. The he number goes one down. quarterback in DVOA right now with minimum 200 pass attempts. Yeah, and then you go Brock Purdy and you get a historic performance out of Mr. Irrelevant. You win the NFC West in a year where you were pretty much written off. Like, not written off, but it was like, Rams, like, how good are the Cardinals going to be? Like, it was very much not in your favor. Seahawks start off very hot early. And you just, you run away with it. I I think it was a really strong performance by Shanahan. I think if he wins, hats off to him. I think Dables is probably the single most impactful coach in football right now. Well said. I think uh, there's there's always deserving candidates, uh, and we've just happened to land on the same side of the argument as Warren Sharp, but won't begrudge anyone for taking it in a different direction. Unless you want to vote for like Robert Sala or Mike McDaniel. Then we can have the discussion. Listen, there's merit. Uh, <laughs> it's It's been a tough year, but or a tough back half of the year, but you know, they made their uh, they made their impacts early. Let's move on, though. I think we've settled this one. Jackson, Saturday night, we've got a battle for the AFC South divisional round. Say what you want about the scheduling process. We're at least getting it in prime time. It'll be a fun watch. Jacksonville Jaguars versus Tennessee Titans. Steven Reese over at the ringer. It's a little bit of a take on the Jacksonville Jaguars. Even though they kind of had this late surge, Tennessee had a late collapse and a lot of injury. In Ruiz's eyes, Jackson, Jaguars were always the best team in the AFC South. The Jaguars, like the the Jaguars fans' current rallying cry, which is it was always the Jags. And I think what you'll see in this game is they they've been the best AFC South team this whole time. Like even before the Titans collapsed with the injuries, with Ryan Tannehill's injuries, the injuries on defense. I. I I think some of us, like even on this pod, I think we've kind of hinted at the fact that we thought that the Jaguars still might have a chance, even when they were down like three games in the standings. And we've seen that play out. And we see, we saw in the first game that they're just a better team. They have a better quarterback. They have a better offense. They, I think they have a, a better offensive staff. I don't know if I'm ready to say that Doug Peterson is a better coach than Mike Vrabel, like in their current iterations. But I think Jaguars win this one easily. And I don't think it would have mattered if Ryan Tannehill played. I don't think it would have mattered if Malik Willis played or who plays at quarterback. The Jaguars are just a better team. Ruiz goes on to say that he thinks the Jaguars will win by three scores on Saturday. That's how much better this team is than the Tennessee Titans. Put it on the meter. Hot take, bad take this time, Kale. I like them now. I agree that the Jags are going to win this game. I agree that the Jags are better now, but I don't agree that the Jags were always better. I think stuff happens in the middle of the season. I just went back and looked through week 11 when the Tennessee Titans were 7-3 and three and the Jags were 3-7. and seven. Was it like, ooh, the Jags were still the better team at the time? Like, stats would tell you they were better? No, of course not. The Titans were 12th in team DVOA. The Jags were 19th. Since then, as we've said, Titans have collapsed. 
Jags have played much better football, which is going to happen when you have one team with an ascending young quarterback making the most of some weapons that were brought in in the offseason and took some time to get acclimated, whereas the Titans had a lot of injuries, including to their quarterback, and have fallen off. But now you look at it, Jacksonville 14th in Team DVOA, Tennessee 23rd. So it's okay to say that the Titans were better at the time. Now the fortunes have flipped because that's kind of what happens when you get a young quarterback who turns all the right switches at the right time. But we couldn't have said that was definitely going to happen. We love Trevor Lawrence, but we had to see it happen in front of our eyes to believe it. So I think it's just a little bit of revisionist history to say it was always the Jags because you know, like things happen mid-season and teams collapse and other teams turn it on at the right time. Can I ask, just could you do me a favor and give me the breakdown of how that total DVOA shakes out? in terms of offense, defense, special team rankings through week 11? Through week 11, Tennessee Titans, as mentioned, were 12th overall. They were 18th in offense, 9th in defense, 14th in special teams. Let's head over to week 17, where the Titans now sit, as we mentioned, at just 23rd. They are currently 21st in offense, down to 16th in defense, and 25th. In special teams. So the biggest drop off you're going to see uh, is actually, well, actually, it's pretty much all, all the way around. They've dropped like seven to nine spots, just a complete and total full scale collapse. Understood. Jackson, I think one of the biggest things for me, I, I also think is the hot take, but I, I think it's a scorching take, but I also think there is a kernel of truth to it in the sense that you look at this Tennessee Titans roster, this was a major, major step back in terms of, like, the defense, personnel-wise, has been really strong this year. And they've been one of the best run defenses in the league. This is also a defense that has been hampered by injuries. They currently have more than 10 players easily. I think it's 11 Total players between Harold Landry, David Long, Caleb Farley, uh, Elijah Moulton, Bud Dupree, Zach Cunningham. They've got a, a basically a starting lines roster of a defense on IR at the moment. And it doesn't get much better on offense. Brian Tannehill, Cody Hollister, Dylan Radens, Taylor Lewan, uh, like They've got a ton of bodies banged up right now. With that being said, I get where Ruiz is coming from. The Tennessee Titans have a strong defense. Defense is harder to maintain year to year. If you're getting a really good defense out right now, like it's not going to be guaranteed that, that carries over next year. What does carry over is offensive performance. And offensive performance-wise, this team was shaky at best. You trade away A.J. Brown. You rely very much on an aging Derrick Henry, which is is worked a little bit. You try to replace A.J. Brown and Julio Jones with Robert Woods coming off an ACL tear and Traylon Burks, who was just an injury-prone A.J. Brown archetype. There were question marks there, and those question marks didn't hit. A team that was equally built off question marks was Jacksonville. You took a project and a guy like Trayvon Walker, number one overall. You over-invest a lot into weapons like Christian Kirk, Zay Jones, Evan Engram. Uh, you make some questionable decisions along the offensive line, like giving Cam Robinson the franchise tag and trying to like rebuild your offensive line in an odd sort of way. Everything is sort of going wrong for the Titans, especially in the back half of the season. And everything kind of went right for the Jacksonville Jaguars in the sense that that $18 million, uh, $18 million a year contract with Christian Kirk really does not look that bad anymore, given other wide receiver contracts and given his performance. The hoopla that was made about that deal did not manifest. A tandem backfield of James Robinson and Travis Etienne. Turns out Etienne, while a questionable first-round pick, is a great investment to have in general. Yeah, uh, Trevor Max is going to be questionable in the first round these days. Yeah, exactly. But you've got a guy in Trevor Lawrence hitting exactly when you need him to. You've got Travis Etienne, 
emerging in his first year of actual NFL play. Each one of your weapons, Christian Kirk, Zay Jones, Evan Engram, that you acquired in the offseason, hit in different ways. And then you have like a big emergence of guys on the defense. You don't have like, you know, like Andre Cisco is an okay pick. Uh, like you got some odd sort of things, but you get like really great edge rusher performances out of uh, Trayvon Walker, Josh Allen, even Arden Key in a backup role as your go to pass rushers. You've got like over performances out of guys like Dwayne Smoot, uh, like Foye Loakun. Like you're getting really good performances out of this front seven. It was just you're kind of maxing both sides. Like a lot had to go wrong for Tennessee and a lot had to go right for Jacksonville. But just at the core of this offense, like this, like if you're just going offenses, because defenses fluctuate, like I said, 11 versus 11, I think Jacksonville always had the better offense. Like, I, you know me. I'm a bit of a Derrick Henry denier. Uh, I'm, I'm Max Kellerman waiting for Tom Brady's fall off, except in this case, Tom Brady is Derrick Henry. Uh, that was basically the crux of what Tennessee was trying to run in 2022. They didn't have seemingly a ton of faith in their passing attack. They didn't really reinvest or replenish the well. I don't think Traylon Burks alone was enough. And I'm, a, you know, Traylon Burks dynasty owner. I like him a lot, but I just don't think he like stays healthy. Uh, Tennessee had a lot of weak spots. and I think they were hoping to take advantage of a bad division. Jacksonville needed a lot of things to hit right, and they had a lot of things hit right. It's a bit of a gamble to say that, like, outright they were better, but I think just on plain roster, ceiling of Jacksonville was always better than ceiling of Tennessee. Yeah, but I think the floor for Tennessee theoretically was also higher, and I think we're seeing the floor right now, and that's a lot higher than what could have happened to the Jags after they lost that Detroit game got punked by Detroit, frankly, and really could have just folded the tent from there. So all the credit in the world to the Jags for hitting their ceiling since then. But we've seen the floor for Tennessee. This is it. Um, and still, you've said all that went wrong. All these things could have still gone wrong. And if Tennessee wins that Houston game with Ryan Tannehill at quarterback, if he doesn't get hurt, and the Jags lose the game to the Cowboys where they're down by 17 in the second half, then we're not even talking about this right now because the Titans would already have this division sewn up. So it is it is truly a case of like everything has gone wrong one way, everything has gone right the other way. So I don't think it makes sense to say, oh, this was always the case. Jackson, if ifs and buts were candies and nuts, then I'd be the king of Denmark. That's what I always say in this case because it's week 18. And we're dealt the we're dealt the hands we got. And I get what you're saying about like flipping certain wins. And trust me, we'll get into conversations about upside and betting on uh certain paths. But I just I just think this was a Jacksonville team that like with such a large investment in upside and in a product that's so based on trying to like like they're in a very much developmental stage right now. And they bring in a guy who they bring in a guy like Doug Peterson, who's, you know, a culture changer has helped develop and like build teams before. I think there was always a way, excuse me. I think there was always a way to unlock this upside. And I get what you're saying that if Tennessee does its job, this wouldn't even be a conversation, but we have the conversation right now. So that's and the I, point to the that's the point to the argument though the 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 take wasn't this was possible the take was they were always better I don't think they were always better I don't think it's a hot take to say that I think things have gone wrong to a point where now they're better but I don't think I think the numbers and our eyes would have told us that six weeks ago the Titans were the better team I still I still just think the ceiling was always higher like like uh, that's not a it's ceiling a different floor league it's a what are you right now league it's a it's a like tangential argument, but I still think the max potential of the Jaguars was always better than the max potential of the Titans. Even though the Titans are an extremely well run team, uh by head coach Mike Vrabel, and like they've got a good stopgap guy in Ryan Tannehill essentially, because he's like, how much longer can you do this with Ryan Tannehill? But 
I just think the ceiling is always higher. I get your, I fully get your argument though. Yeah. I mean, it's just a question of like, how are we defining they were better? If their max potential is the argument, then sure. I don't, I think there's this revisionist thing going on where people were saying like, oh no, the things just weren't breaking the Jags way, but they were still the better team at the time. I think the Titans have fallen off and the Jags have improved to a point where they only just became the better team. Listen, we'll get into my over-unders, but you, I was always Jacksonville over five and a half, Tennessee under nine. And both those hit for me so far, so I'll take them. Jackson, let's move on. I think we've exhausted this topic to its fullest extent. Let's talk about missing quarterbacks, Jess. Speaking of Ryan Tannehill, who is not playing for this Tennessee Titans team. Little Damian Woody on first take talks about two other potential missing quarterbacks heading into the playoffs. Two big ones, mind you. Let's uh, let's not belabor the point anymore. What's Woody got to say? This is not this is not just system we're talking about. We're talking about a guy where you you take Jalen Hurts out of that equation. They can, like they're having a hard. They can't win football games. We saw and they have our, much we, higher expectations. It, as well. Absolutely. I mean, we let you know last week we saw what, what they look like against the New Orleans Saints. Mm-hmm. They could they could barely put up any points. It's because of the, the extra dimension that Jalen Hurts get, gives them both running and passing. I'm not knocking Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson is a, is a former MVP in this league. Is a guy that obviously the the Baltimore Ravens offensively missed Lamar Jackson. But I think. Even with Lamar Jackson, I don't look at Baltimore as a Super Bowl contender. I think they're just better, alter- better teams in the AFC, even if Lamar Jackson is healthy. I think if you take Jalen Hurts out of the equation for the Philadelphia Eagles, I think that knocks them off the perch as the prohibitive favorite in the NFC. Interesting way to frame this. It's not a question of, is Lamar Jackson better than Jalen Hurts or vice versa? It's, which loss means more to their team heading into this year's playoffs or which quarterback more so factors into the overall playoff picture. That's really the way I would think about it. Which return would have more of an impact on this year's playoffs? Lamar Jackson or Jalen Hurts? Damian Woody's saying Jalen Hurts. Yeah, it's lukewarm because it's dead on. Like, there's not really, like, a huge, like, contentious argument here. Yeah, obviously. The one thing I like about the Baltimore Ravens is that they they have managed. We've talked we've talked about this off mic and in separate conversations. The Baltimore Ravens are fascinating because offensively they've been able to find a guy who is just B minus Lamar Jackson. He's very much not as good a thrower, but Tyler Huntley is absolutely the mobile quarterback that works for the Baltimore Ravens offense. You have a replacement. Jackson. In terms of dual threat quarterbacks, I'd like to just I'd like to just show you a highlight that I used at any given Sunday this week. This is an option play where Jalen Hurt or uh, Gardner Minshew fakes the run. Look at look at just how much that the New Orleans Saints respect Gardner Minshew as a runner. No one's going <laughs> no one's going his way. No one is no one is considering the keeper option for Gardner Minshew. And I think that's the biggest point. Hey, is shout that, out to our precursor. Shout out to uh, Football Outsiders Friday Film Room, which existed before the takeaway. That's uh, that's a callback to an old hallmark of our YouTube channel. Yes, yes. Listen, love working, love working with Derek. It was some of the most informative couple weeks of my life in terms of film watching. I like doing the takeaway with you too. I won't pick favorites, but <laughs> don't you dare. <laughs> at least, at least we can get a little intermix in the last week. That being said. It's the, it's the key difference between the two. You're obviously missing, like, the explosives of, you know, Lamar Jackson hitting a 35-year-old, Deshaun Jackson, uh, 65 yards down the field on a rope, uh, where if Deshaun Jackson's on 35, he runs that end for an 85-yard touchdown. But those are, like, the singular explosives that, frankly, Baltimore really doesn't call all that often. Uh, it's not a thing really like in their regular repertoire. Uh, they'll run screens to Patrick Ricard or what have you, but it's not as big of a, uh, like what you're missing from Lamar 
being absent and replacing him with Tyler Huntley is not the same as what you're missing by replacing Jalen Hurts with Gardner Minshew. You're not getting any of the mobility. You're getting a worse passer. Jalen Hurts, there, people question Jalen Hurts as a passer. You're getting an abjectly worse passer in Gardner Minshew. You're getting a guy who double clutches. You're getting a guy who does not throw the ball away under pressure and tries to extend plays uh, without having the necessary legs to do so. It's it's a night and day difference. I, I think you at least have a borderline replacement quarterback in Tyler Huntley. You have a guy who can barely game manage in Gardner Minshew, and I was all over the I was all over the rookie or Minshew train. Minute. You are missing so much more from Hertz's game by getting Minshew in than you are losing out on Lamar Jackson. I, that last point, I just I just have to disagree with. Completely. Like, Tyler Huntley is a worse quarterback than Gardner Minshew. He just is. DYAR positive for Minshew, DVOA positive for Minshew, and pretty comfortable margins. Uh, Tyler Huntley is negative in both by also a wide margin. Like, they're just not the same guy. Now, I, I do, think, I do I... think that there's still a, a good lukewarm take there. I, I agree that most people will, will consider Hurts the bigger loss to the team, but... Let's not let's not say that Minshew is like way worse than Huntley. Can't keep a team afloat because I think he's a better quarterback. You're losing a ton of what made Philadelphia great because you're taking parts of like. There's a lot of times because Philadelphia is really based on two passing options as wide receivers and like a good tight end in Dallas Goddard. You're getting a lot of times where defenses just have you locked up for the first three seconds in coverage. For the most part, Jalen Hurts' just threat as a rusher is what really opens up those windows. That gets guy like that gets guys open because then you have to spy and like the improvisation factor has to open up paths and coverage, what have you. Gardner Minshew isn't that same threat, so you don't really have to cover it as well. Like he can't get the ball off the same. I get what you're saying in terms of like pure passing stats. Like, yeah, Gardner Minshew is a better, it's an absolutely better pass than Tyler Huntley. But in terms of like the availability of the playbook, like you can call more of your textbook offense with Tyler Huntley than yeah, you can work with as well. Minshew. What? Yeah, it just won't work as well. You, I, you can do I a lot of the same stuff. It just won't work. You're cutting out like entire sections by putting in Gardner Minshew because he's not as he's not as good of a rusher. I don't think he's good of a deep ball. Like I think you're missing way more key elements of your offense by moving from Hurts to Minshew that you would moving from Jackson to Huntley. And I get yeah, it's not as good of a product. I'm just yeah, saying but the Eagles have scored 22 points per game with Minshew in there, and the Ravens have scored 12 points a game with Huntley in there. So. Maybe you're taking away more parts of the offense if you want to look at it that way. But if you want to look at like results on the field, Minshew better than Huntley, Eagles better without Hurts than Ravens are without Lamar. We're also getting into a thing where like, yeah, if you weren't throwing to uh, the Kansas City wide receiver who was there for forever, but now I can't <laughs> Not remember. Forever, like two and a half years, Sammy Watkins. No, not Sammy Watkins. Uh, the other guy. The other he was there, he was there for forever alongside Sammy Watkins and also played behind Miko Carmen. He was always oh, like Marcus Robinson. Also Marcus Robinson. Robinson. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Demarcus Robinson. He was there. He was drafted. By whatever. Uh you like your top three guys are Demarcus Robinson, a 35-year-old, uh, Deshaun Jackson, and now Sammy Watkins as well. But Sammy Watkins was a late addition. Like you don't have the pieces to really do this. I like. There's larger questions we can ask about like, oh yeah, if you only have Mark Andrews and like you don't have a ton of receiver, uh, like Huntley can only do so much. I think there's a larger indictment on like the Ravens ro- offensive skill position roster to be had. I just think like replacement level, like Huntley, Huntley fits what Baltimore does well. Minshew, much less so. I yeah. get what you're saying by performance. Yeah, but yeah, it's 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 like a fit versus performance thing. I still will, I'll agree with you, but I'll say performance is more important to me. But I just to return briefly to the original take before we move on, um, I I do think that it's lukewarm because I think most people will agree that Hertz is the bigger factor. 
But I will point out that when Lamar Jackson goes down after in the middle of week 13, after week 13, Philly third in overall team DVOA, Baltimore four. So they're right there. And maybe we're not viewing them as as much of a contender because they are flawed in ways that Philly is not. But they have these strengths, right? Like they had the sixth defense at the time. Defense has only grown stronger as Roquan Smith has factored in more, gotten more reps on under his belt with them. Uh, and they were the number one special teams DVOA at the time. So there's there's still a scary out if they're fully intact, which obviously right now they aren't. And I would still say that slightly bigger factor is whether Hurts is 100. percent But don't count out the don't count out the Ravens with Lamar. They 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 know what they're good at and they stick to it. Certainly not. Certainly not. It, it's the this current era of Ravens is very much like this current era of like Tomlin Steelers or it's like, no matter what, just because of the coach and the staff, they're able to or like the roster. They're able to put together every year. Like you just got to respect it. just yeah. a little bit. No, I, I, I wouldn't want to see if I'm Cincinnati and I'm playing them this week with Tyler Huntley, just to have to turn around next week and play them again with Lamar. I don't like that very much. Not one bit, not one bit. Let's move on and close out our headlines. Seth Walter from ESPN via the Bill Barnwell podcast, Bill Barnwell show rather, presented an interesting argument, Jackson. Black Monday's coming up around the corner. Mm -hmm. You'll be able to catch our coverage on Wednesday on the news show. But a lot of new head coaching vacancies will be available and created. We got a little will they, won't they? We got a little would you like one or the other? And they're fun because they're both the horse teams in the NFL. Jackson, yeah. would you rather have the Colts head coaching job or the Broncos head coaching job? Let's hear Walter break it down. Uh, the possible coaching opportunities that are coming available, and I would assume the Colts will be one of them, is the Colts job. If you were offered the Colts job and the Broncos job right now, which would be more appealing to you given their respective situations? Ooh. Uh, that's a really good question. Part of it, I think, would have to depend on <clears throat> what it's like would have to depend on the assurances, I think, that you're getting from ownership. Like, if you're taking that Broncos job, I think you're going to want to be like, I'm going to try and fix Russell Wilson. But I, mean, I want it to yeah. be clear that if I can't, that that is not going to be a reflection on me and I'm going to get a chance with the next guy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so if you don't get that kind of assurance, then I think the Colts is better because at least there's like a blank slate there. Denver obviously has a lot more going for it mm -hmm. on the roster. For sure. Um, so I think I would, I think I would lean Denver um, yeah. just because of that. Denver job is more ideal if you get the insurance that you can survive in a post Wilson world. Barnwell goes on to say there's probably some survivorship bias because of that notion where they wouldn't hire a guy that at least kind of believes in Russell Wilson. Now, Jackson, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to put this on the meter, but I'd also like you to answer the question. Do you rather have the Colts job or the Broncos job? I'll, I'll go in reverse order. I would rather have the Broncos job, Kale. You know why? Cause Indianapolis, if we just throw records out, I think you can make a very strong case that Indianapolis is the worst team in the league right now and has the bleakest future. No quarterback. Start there. Um, worst team overall DVOA, worst offense overall DVOA, and bottom six in every other DVOA category. Actually, that's not true. Their defense is 14th. Misreading the table a little bit. But Denver's defense is better. Denver's offense is better. Denver's special teams are better. Every single unit of this team is slightly better than Indy's. Now, I understand that Russ is a conundrum, but I would rather work with Russ and, as they said, like have that flexibility to maybe keep my job if Russ doesn't pan out than just start over from ground zero. The worst job to take over is a job with no quarterback, and that's a big piece of why the whole Josh McDaniels indie thing didn't pan out because Josh McDaniels was like, ooh, I'm going to come in and butter my bread with Andrew Luck, and obviously that doesn't end up transpiring. 
And I think there's probably some like injury news that led to him deciding to turn down the job before Luck ended up making the ultimate decision to retire. So if you have if you have any assurance that you might have a future at the quarterback position, that's the more appealing job. Then you layer on top of it that Denver has the better defense, probably better pieces on the offensive side too. Got these young receivers. You're going to get Javante Williams back next year. I agree with the take. Where I'm going to flip it though towards lukewarm is how they couch it. It's like, ah, I want to make sure that I can keep my job and have some flexibility if Russell Wilson doesn't work out. Russell Wilson already got his first coach in Denver fired. So I don't think you're special here. I don't think you can just come in and say, no, I, I want to run things my way. Like, no, they've given the bag to Russell Wilson. So you got to fix him. I'm still doing that overtaking over the hellscape that is the Colts, but you got to fix Russell Wilson if you want to keep this job. Okay, let's let's address that one. I think we know at this point, <laughs> they'll never admit it, but I think we know at this point that Nathaniel Hackett was hired to bring in Aaron Rodgers at the quarterback position. He was, mm-hmm. he was, he was, he was the human red carpet for Rodgers to walk down, and it didn't <laughs> work out. I think... It's a fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me thing with Russell Wilson, where he can't get two head coaches fired. He is not that good where he is like so salvageable that it's like, yeah, we've just got to, you know, like we've just got to ride this out. It has to be this guy's fault. After we saw this first season and we hired a new guy, it still has to be the new guy's fault. It can't be Russell's fault. Like he's not getting that long of leash. I think you can pretty generally get that insurance policy that uh, that Walter is requesting without having to like do too many uh, do too much like gymnastics or like sell your soul too much to do that. I disagree because I think it depends who you are. Are you in the ilk of like a Shane Sykin, Ben Johnson being hired to fix this offense? Because if you don't do that with Russell Wilson. It's sort of like the Cliff Kingsbury hire. It's like, okay, you're coming in to coach Kyler Murray. If you don't fix the offense with Kyler Murray, you know, are you going to get that chance with a new quarterback? I'm not sure whoever comes into Denver does. Now, if they hire D'Amico Ryans and he continues to run a dominant defense and the Russell Wilson thing doesn't work out, then I could see him getting the assurance of, okay, we hired you to be a good defensive coach. You have been. We'll bring in a new quarterback. We'll restructure the offensive room get you a better coordinator or whatever. So I think it all depends on who this coach is and what he's being hired to do. What, what are the expectations here? Yes, I agree. I get what you're saying. I just think you get a little bit more of an insurance policy considering that Denver has an out in Wilson's contract after 24. So I think they have a little bit, like now it's like, all right, now it's a prove it thing for us. But let me get back to the original question. Jackson, I don't know if we're just trying to be extra contentious because this is the last show and we got some debate in us. We got a little got a little heat we need to, you know, work yeah, out. I'm consciously not trying to this week. I think I've been like too eager to say that takes are not something I agree with just for the sake of the show. This week I'm like really trying to consider every single take and see if I agree with it or not. Jackson, can I make an argument that the Indianapolis Colts are the better job? I mean, I'm not going to stop you from doing it. I'm, I'm unlikely to agree with it. I really am. Yeah. So I think the argument that we've laid out about Russell Wilson is, like, shows the kind of hyper-stress that exists in this job. Jim Mercer just hired a guy off of Get Up on ESPN. I don't think this is a high-stakes job at the moment. I think there is an understanding in Indianapolis that trying to keep this ship afloat has not worked out. And that this is pretty much about as open a rebuild as you can have. The thing is, you don't need to do a total, total rebuild. Defensively, you've got a lot of your front seven locked in. You've got Shaq Leonard coming back from multiple injuries who will have a full offseason of recovery after undergoing back surgery and coming back from back surgery and then missing time with back and neck issues. Like he was a, he was a big issue. You're getting him back fully healthy. You've also got guys like Quiddy pay. You've got Grover Stewart, DeForest 
Buckner, Zaire Franklin, your front seven defensively, you've got your keys pretty much locked in. And you've got Yannick and Gakwe on an extra year's worth of a deal. Secondary is a little bit more shaky. I think Stephon Gilmore's on a two year deal. Kenny Moore's on IR. He'll be back healthy. You've got some pieces to work around there in the secondary, but like you've got a good kind of core of what you've got right now. Offensively, your biggest guy, Quentin Nelson, even in the down year, like you've got Quentin Nelson locked up. You have some additional pieces because this is a bottom 10 line in the league, 26th in adjusted line yards, 24th in adjusted sack rate on the year. Typically, this is a good line for the Colts. You got good offensive line coaches in the building already. You could probably keep them around unless you're going to find elsewhere. But you've got like a good, like, kind of core in there that you can build off of. The things that you're really missing are skill position guys. You got one guy you can rely on, Michael Pittman. You got a kind of emergent player in Alec Pierce. But beyond that, you're pretty much blank slate. Jonathan Taylor on IR. You can get him back next year. But like the hardest positions you're missing are quarterback. You obviously get like that's the hardest position to find in football. I get it. But you can also get good replacement level play out of a lot of guys in football that we've seen this season. Hasn't come from any of the Colts, but we've seen replacement guys in San Francisco. The one thing that hasn't gotten replacement level play out of quarterbacks consistently for the last five years, the Colts. So I don't think you want to go that route again. I understand it. I'm not saying go the veteran route. I'm saying that we've seen that in offensive schemes, there's way – like you can bring in a playbook that 40 quarterbacks in the league can function out of. It wasn't the Colts playbook this year because Nick, Nick Foles, Sam Ellinger, and Matt Ryan all fail. But we've seen guys like, you know, Jared Stidham just had a 340-yard game against the San Francisco 49ers defense. If you're telling me you can't find – a Jacoby Brissett to come back into the building and play with you. Run it back. Same thing from two years ago. Let's do it. Yeah. I'm just asking for a stopgap. This is a multi-year rebuild, Jackson. I'm saying you've got the one hardest position to worry about, but I'd rather not be hamstrung with a guy guaranteed $130 million who's making weird subway commercials, who's like just an absolute like alienating quarterback to be around from all – given reports outside of the last like three weeks where guys decide to defend Russell Wilson again. Quarterback's the hardest position to find, but I think you have like a fun thing to do where it's like you've got most of the pieces in place on the defensive side. You've got a line with an anchor you can work around in Quentin Nelson. You've got like a couple young skill position players. You really don't need much to make this a competitive uh, team. And I think that exists especially because the competition you're facing Instead of picking against whatever the Las Vegas Raiders become, the Kansas City Chiefs twice a year, and the Los Angeles Chargers twice a year, you get your biggest threat is Trevor Lawrence twice a year. You don't really have to worry about the Titans. You don't really have to worry about the Texans. You can comfortably make the playoffs given your respective competition. I think it's a better environment. I think you have a longer leash, and I think you have – genuinely a little like it's harder to replace but i think you have less to replace than what you got to do in denver i think you got to be very careful about what you do in denver because so guys are locked up so many guys are due contracts it's i like i like indy's job a little bit more just because it's such a blank slate but you already have like your key pieces in place like you're not starting from total scratch but you get a lot of freedom in what you do bring in if I'm a Colts fan and I own season tickets and the Colts bring in another stopgap quarterback this year, I'm selling my season tickets, suing the franchise, and moving to Green Bay to root for the Packers. Like, I am what a done weird, with stopgaps. What I'm a weird Indiana. pivot. Why would, why would you go from Indianapolis to Green Bay, Jack? I don't know. any. I'd go anywhere else because this team does not, ex, does not get to call itself a serious franchise if they try and run back another stopgap. Draft a quarterback. And you just said you prefer Houston's situation. Houston's got a better draft pick. They get to take whatever quarterback they want. Indy might get the third quarterback. Maybe they have to trade up. Maybe they trade down and still take the third guy. But Houston's getting Bryce Young if they want Bryce Young. Houston's got it. Red carpet laid out, as you said. Indy, I don't know who the quarterback's going to be. Maybe it's not the guy I really want. 
I want to know who my quarterback is going to be, and I want a better roster around me. And despite the fact that Russell Wilson had a terrible year, the Broncos' vacancy is more appealing overall. Even with quarterback, I'd rather take – I'd rather do, like, take Levis fifth overall, let's say, like project quarterback, bench him for a year, bring in stopgap guy, but know you have a guy on the bench instead of Sam Ellinger is taking fourth or fifth round. Like, that's not the stopgap option. <laughs> Stop gap, stop gap option is a guy coming in for a year, sitting behind a top five overall pick. Like, I still think you have way better availability in Indianapolis to, like, find that replacement. And also, I don't care. I don't care who Houston's number one overall pick is. It could be Stroud. It could be Bryce Young. They Like, it doesn't matter to me. I don't trust the Houston Texans to do full rebuild. I don't care. Roll the tape beginning of the season when Kale said that Houston was going over on their wins total and that he sneaky thought they were a competent football team. Yeah, I think they're a competent football team. I don't trust them to like win a division. I trust them to win more than four and a half games. That's not a problem. They finished two games shy of that goal pending a result this week. I'm fine with my pick. I'm just saying, I think if you're looking at like – Houston versus Indy right now. I might go Houston, so I'm certainly taking Denver over Indy. I think Indy is like maybe the worst situation of any team in football right now because top to bottom roster wise, their performance has been the worst of any team this year. If you just look at stats instead of wins and losses, and don't know who their quarterback's going to be, don't get their first pick of quarterbacks in the draft. Jackson, it's time for our best and worst take of the year. Nice. We've given the opportunity to give ourselves some superlatives to look back and really reflect on the kind of analysis that we gave this year. And let's start. Let's. Start I want to end. Best, please start with the best. No, no, Jackson. I want to end on. I want to end on a good note. I want to like really close out and give ourselves a nice little pat on the back. All right. But before we do that, we got to take some tomatoes. We got to we got to put up our worst take. Would you like to go first or should I? I'd love to. I'd love okay. to. Now, we have to we have to hold ourselves to a standard here. You can only say like 10 seconds worth of <laughs> stuff to try and rationalize your take here. That you're not allowed to do any more than that. You got to sit there and take your tomatoes. So, week 6, staff picks article and following it up on the takeaway, I included a video clip for you to play for the folks, Kale. I said the Raiders had a decent chance to make the playoffs. And say the Las Vegas Raiders are more likely to make the playoffs than the Arizona Cardinals, than the Denver Broncos, than the Jags, and all in between. Do I have very solid statistical backing for this? In terms of DVOA stats, no, I do not. Uh, but the Raiders are still up there in terms of the Dave projections, a.k.a. preseason, what we thought combined with this year. They're still the 16th ranked team. So despite the fact that they have underperformed and underwhelmed, they're still a talented football team. They should have beaten the Chiefs. That was a bad loss in terms of them making the playoffs because they needed that game and they outplayed the Chiefs for the most part. But you've got an offense with Devontae Adams still doing Devontae Adams things. Josh Jacobs averaging the highest yards per carry of his career by far. It's an actually efficient Josh Jacobs, and that's a scary thought. The Raiders only play, I think, four more teams with winning records, and two of them are in their division. And the other two are the Titans and Colts, which don't scare me at all. I think this is a soft schedule for a team that can get right against the Texans this week and fight their way back to 500. Jackson, did they get right against the Texans? They won the game. Uh, then the next week, they got shut out by New Orleans and didn't cross midfield until the fourth quarter. And I instantly knew I was cooked. And not only that, but they later went on to lose to the Jeff Saturday Colts and the two-day Amazon Prime shipping quarterback Baker Mayfield in the LA Rams. So hand up. Bad take. <sighs> Jackson. Jackson. I get it. <laughs> we all had some takes about the AFC West uh, that uh, that might have not panned out. Mine, not just, didn't, didn't come from a staff article. 
Uh, didn't come from a from a little snippet on the show. Came from a whole publication that I pitched <laughs> called Russell Wilson and Nathaniel Hackett just need some patience. But Russell Wilson and Nathaniel Hackett patience is key. Take a look. Take a look, Dax. And for the most part, I had it right in the sense that this Broncos team is all or nothing. They constantly kick themselves because they keep getting penalized. They are unable to score in the red zone. They have such deep inexperience at play caller that like Nathaniel Hackett doesn't know you can't call the same play in the red zone twice in a row uh, in the same formation and expect different results. Uh, Like I had all of this, right? I, and then, and then this play, this play just dissuades me. Like I had the whole thing dead to right. And I let, a timing route by Russell Wilson late against the San Francisco 49ers. Just throw all this out the window to me. That he throws this ball. Look at how draped in coverage Cortland Sutton is on this route. Just look look at where the coverage is of by Chavarius Ward when Russell Wilson throws this ball. Sutton doesn't even have his head turned. He's in step with Javarius Ward and his man. And the ball beats him right here the second he turns around. I thought this was the timing that could exist when Russell Wilson builds a rapport in this offense. I thought the fact that in these throw charts, he's starting to hit the middle of the field a little bit more. He's starting to do some stuff. They have some problems to work out, but like they can fix it, right? No, they didn't fix it at all. Russell Wilson's laughing stock. Nathaniel Hackett got fired. I'm talking about how the Colts' job is better than the Broncos' job. Uh, n- in no way was the state correct. Props to you for admitting it, because I thought we were going down that road of justifying the take, and and you pulled it back, and you rightfully threw egg on your own face uh, because the Broncos, as you have so eloquently stated, uh, fell flat on their face for the entire rest of the season. I'm, I mean, the biggest underperformance uh, that we've seen from, like, expectations in preseason to reality, the fact that this team was, uh, like, what, I think it was, like, plus 1,700 to win the Super Bowl. Like, the fact that they were even that high up and not 50 to 1 or worse. Uh, like, I think no one had a right read on this team. But I spent two-thirds of an article painting exactly why – Denver was bad. And I even said, like, used a reference to Occam's Razor in the article to say, like, the most obvious answer is always right. And then said, no, let me uh, let me just pivot and let one pass play change my whole perception on what the Denver Broncos can do, huh? Huh. Yeah, it didn't work. All right, Jackson. Let's. We've exercised the demons, Jackson. Let's give ourselves a bit more of a pat on the back. Jackson, give me your best take of the year. Now, I I have to admit, this wasn't that easy to find, Kale. (laughs) It's unfortunate. Um, I had a couple that are like more imminently proven right that I'll say just very briefly. I had uh, Deshaun Watson. That trade is going to work out just as badly for Cleveland as the Russ Wilson trade has for Denver. Uh, so far, feeling pretty good about that one, uh, given that the Broncos or that the Browns don't have uh, their next three first round picks. But, 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 I will say that my best take, at least like with some current value, is I took the Cowboys as my best sleeper to win a Super Bowl about eight, nine weeks ago. And I currently, if you look at this article, hold a 14 to 1. Really 1460, so a little more than 14 to 1 Cowboys Super Bowl odds ticket. And if you haven't seen the past few weeks, Jalen Hurts has been down for the Eagles. There's still a world where the Cowboys might get the one seed, depending on when this episode comes out. Uh, they're probably going to go up against a Tampa team in the first round that's 8 and 9 and has just looked like a shell of its former self all year. Uh, the Vikings, are you afraid of the Vikings? Not particularly. 
And yes, the Niners are very scary, but they also still have Mr. Irrelevant playing quarterback. So, you know, maybe this could still end up being more egg on my face, and I'll happily take it if it is. But I think it's a good take to have the Cowboys at 14-1 to to win the Super Bowl sitting in my back pocket right now. I like it. I like it a lot. Uh, The competition they've been able to put up against Philadelphia, uh, I think, really solidifies it for me. I think the Cowboys have come a long, long way. Since the beginning of the offense season. since Dak Prescott came back. That's people, yeah. people won't say it. I will. Good offense. <laughs> people <laughs> refuse. People the media refuse doesn't want you to acknowledge that Dak Prescott is good at football. Yeah, nobody wants to say it. I will. He's good. <laughs> hey, listen, I'll give you one thing. You're a brave man. You're a brave man, Jackson. Jackson. I don't want to totally Toot my own horn here. I had a good, I had an okay year of takes. It's because of a little volume shooting, mind you. But had I had Seattle, Green Bay, and Detroit at different points all competing for playoff spots yeah. uh, in preseason win loss totals, uh, I'm currently 19 and 9. Uh, with four outstanding, and my biggest hits were like taking overs on the Jets, uh, taking overs on the Lions, taking unders on the Packers and Rams. Had some big misses like uh, Tampa Bay over, Buffalo over, Seattle under. Uh, like, I, it's not perfect. I also had Denver under on 10, which I think that was a cakewalk. So, like, got some wins there. I think my first time writing a Football Outsiders book chapter saying that the Jets have a really good roster that is going to be heavily relying on their rookies, but their upward mobility is really dependent on their quarterback play, uh, and quarterback will be about like their biggest limiter. Uh, I think I was okay on that front. I don't know if that was the most obvious take, but I liked the Jets a lot coming into this year, and I feel vindicated in that regard. But Jackson, the take I've alluded to, all year. It's hanging on by a thread. But it hasn't come to fruition. And again, yours like has yet to come true, but like at least you're confirmed having it be possible because, you know, the Cowboys have clinched the playoffs. <sighs> My take, Jackson. Back in week 7, the staff picks. We were asked Every year feels like there's a, sorry, I'll give you the exact question. Since 1990, two and four teams have only made the playoffs 10% of the times. However, three different teams did it last year. Which two and four or worse team is the best bet to turn things around and make the 2022 playoffs? I take the Detroit Lions. Picking an AFC team in this exercise feels like an automatic failure. They had an easy schedule. Most of their negative point differential came from a shellacking by the Patriots. They were still a top five offense at this point, and I rode with them. The fact they were the worst defense in the league, I was like, ah, oh, maybe they, maybe they adjust. The immediate first comment: No, Kale, no, don't trust the Lions to do something good. They are the scorpion that drowns the frog. Jackson, I'll hang my hat on it. Win or loss this week, I feel vindicated in the fact that in week 18, the Detroit Lions, after starting out one in four, one in five to the season, were still very much alive for the postseason. And even if they don't make it, I'll give myself a pat on the back. That's all you're going to get. You're going to get a pat on the back, buddy. Um, They have a 13% chance per our odds right now to make the playoffs. You know what? That's like weighted by like. That's weighted by the odds in other games. They make it in one in four circumstances. And I picked the Rams to win this week. I think they beat the Green Bay Packers regardless of playoff status. So if they go out with a win, I'll be happy. All right. I like it, but I'm just saying that you're going out with a take on top of a take because you're, you're still like asserting the take that – two things are going to happen this week in order for this to break right for you. And I'm pulling for you, man. But uh, I believe it was uh, 
a young man named Kale Clinton who once used the phrase, uh, if ifs and buts were candies and nuts, I'd be the king of Denmark. Uh, Lions got to make the playoffs for this take to come true, buddy. Listen, I'm fine with it even being viable. It was, it was a Hail Mary, and I've had enough decently correct takes to just say the fact that this take is even alive in week 18 is good enough for me to hang my hat on. If we, if we want like a take that's been confirmed, go back and read the New York Jets almanac chapter. Go back and read the Patriots chapter for that matter. I had questions about the defense, but I think I was dead on on the offense. You can read the season previews, and you can read next season's previews where I'll have a lot more things to say about the Jets quarterback. But, hey, I'm going to hang my hat on this Lions one because I it's it's been the take I've been riding on all year. And depending on, and like you said, depending on when this comes out, this will either be the biggest egg on my face, or it'll I'll feel extra vindicated. Shining. But hey, we'll see. Broncos country. That's right. Jackson. That'll do it for us at the takeaway. What a season it's been. We're gonna go back at some point and do an autopsy on this season, and it'll be one of the most fascinating in recent memory. Bizarre quarterback play. I think both ends of the spectrum looked like they fell into place in terms of the team. Most of the teams we thought would be good were good. Most of the teams we thought were bad would be bad. Everything in the middle feels like a like a hodgepodge, a mishmash of nonsense to me that I've yet to get my head straight on. And it has been a fascinating season full of fantastic takes. And I wouldn't want to do it with anyone else. Same goes to you, buddy. And I just wanted to say that if you've watched the takeaway all season and stuck with us, thank you very much. Would like to thank our friends at Underdog Fantasy once again. Underdogfantasy.com. Download Underdog in the App Store. Promo code OUTSIDERS to double your first deposit up to $100. Also, don't forget to sign up to FO Plus at footballoutsiders.com slash subscribe. You get NFL betting picks. You get fantasy advice. Get all of our DVOA and DYAR statistics. You get our premium articles. You get an ad-free experience. Last but certainly not least, join us on the FO Discord in-game conversation every single week. Yes, sir. Jump in on Discord. And also don't forget to watch the FO News Show every Wednesday throughout the playoffs. We'll be back. We will be back. And we might even sneak some takes in there. We got to be objective journalists. Might catch a take or two because we've got that itch in us that can only be scratched by a show like The Takeaway. Thank you all for listening. The last time this season for Jackson, I'm Kale. Hopefully, we'll see you next season. Come on back.